Hello everybody and thank you so much for tuning in to Get Holy and Die Trying. My name is Annie and today we're going to start a whole brand new series called The Holy Meet and Greet. I don't know about you guys but sometimes I hear so much about these theologians or saints or people in church history and I don't even really know where to start with actually getting to know who they were or what they were about or why they were important or anything like that. So we're going to start this series to give you kind of a nice first step and hopefully leave you with some beginner resources to get to know these saints or people or whoever better. And I thought where better to start on a series about big, imposing, important, heady, wonderful people than the greatest theologian in church history, Saint Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas was the seventh son of a very wealthy, very noble Italian family that lived outside of Aquino. Aquino, Aquinas. Anyway, he grew up right near a Benedictine abbey. The Benedictines are the oldest and first Catholic religious order. They still exist today. And his father, seeing opportunity for his young son, had him sent there to be educated from the age of five. His family had big dreams for Thomas. They wanted to see him get very educated, go on, have this wonderful career in the church, and eventually become the abbot or head of that particular Benedictine Abbey by where they lived. So that's where he started. And then at the age of 14, he was moved to the University of Naples, where he would do the equivalent of what you and I might call an undergraduate degree. Naples was an interesting place at the time, and there was a renewed academic focus in the works of Aristotle, an ancient Greek philosopher. And that'll come up later, so don't forget it. Like young people today, when St. Thomas went to university, he was exposed to all different kinds of things, things that he had never seen or thought of before, one of which being a completely different order than the Benedictines, the Dominicans. The Dominicans still exist today, and they're one of the older orders, but at the time when St. Thomas met them, the order had only really been founded about 30 years ago, so it was new and hip and different, and these vibrant young priests and sisters were called the Order of Preachers. They still are called that today because their whole charism, or mission, is to go out and spread the good word, but also shut down any heresy or poor teaching that they come into contact with. They're a fantastic order, and I totally recommend going and visiting them. I think I have a clip of some Dominican sisters dancing too, which is so wholesome. I'll put it in here if I do. After a lot of time and prayer and consideration, St. Thomas came to understand that God was calling him to be a Dominican, not a Benedictine. So he reluctantly told his family that he was choosing a new way for himself. But his father, having sought this high, lofty, religious, and political career for his son for so long, was furious about his son's decision. So what did he do? He sent all of Thomas's older brothers to physically kidnap him from the University of Naples and drag him home to Aquino, where they kept him locked in the house for an entire year. One of my favorite stories about St. Thomas's life happens during this period. It's said that, at least in hopes of persuading him to live a life of luxury and wealth, his parents hired a woman of ill repute to come into his room and seduce St. Thomas. But upon seeing the prostitute, instead of giving in to his own lustful inclination, he ran to his fireplace, pulled a burning log from the fire, and chased the woman out of the room with it. Then he took the coals from that log and traced a giant cross on his wall. And upon kneeling in front of it and praying for purity, his guardian angel appeared to him and placed a literal chastity belt around his waist. They call it St. Thomas's cincher. And it's said that from that moment, that mystical belt being worn cured him of ever feeling physical temptation like that or lust again. It's actually not that crazy when you think of the Catholic lore that's out there. And a lot of Catholics over the last hundreds and hundreds of years have pointed to this moment in Thomas's life as being the source of his brilliance. They say that his intellect was so sharp and he was so well-spoken and good at what he did because his vision wasn't clouded by his physical wants. 
In fact, the censure of St. Thomas is something that Catholics can still be enrolled in, much like the tradition of the scapular, or even somewhat like the tradition of the miraculous medal. After not only this episode, but I'm sure what were many long nights and tenches dinner table conversations, a full year later, Thomas finally convinced his parents that there was no changing his mind. He left for the University of Paris to study with the Dominicans. And while he was there, his short stature, slow speech, and prematurely receding hairline earned him the title of the Dumb Ox. That was how his classmates and teachers made fun of him. But his brilliance didn't go unnoticed for long, because it was around then that he started writing, and people noticed. Thomas's writing was brilliant. It was so distinct and clear and forward-thinking that a whole new style of approach to theology was named after him. It's called Thomistic Theology, or Thomism. And Thomism is most notably known for two approaches. The first approach is looking at the classics, so philosophers like Aristotle and other ancient Greeks, and marrying their philosophy to what was modern science and church teaching at the time. You know, we think of the Dark Ages when St. Thomas Aquinas lived as these horrible, dreary times in human existence, but that's just not the case. Out of this period came a lot of scientific advancements that would develop into modern day antibiotics, and cultural advancements, and artistic advancements that we still reference today. So there was that, there was marrying the classics with what was modernity at the time, and there was also a huge renewed focus on natural law. Natural law, to put it very simply, is the idea that the world functions the way it does because it was created to. There is a natural law that is established by God that determines our right and proper functions as people or created beings. Out of his interest in natural law came one of his most famous works called The Five Ways, or The Five Ways to Prove the Existence of God Logically. How often do I hear people talking about knowing God and feeling God and just feeling close to God? Well, we don't all have that. Not all Catholics or Christians or people have that experience. And if God objectively exists, there must be some objective way to prove that he's out there. Objective meaning that it's not just dependent on my emotional response or my personal experience. And the five ways are a really great introduction to doing just that. The first is probably the most famous. It's called the moved mover theory, and you might have come in contact with it at some point. Sometimes it's called moved mover, sometimes it's called unmoved mover. The idea is that every action, everything that happens in the world, is the direct response of a different action. There is potential action until something is acted upon, and then that thing becomes active. So think about a line of dominoes, right? They fall and they knock each other over, but something has to start that process. There has to be a mover that moves independently. Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas said that that was God. God set the ball rolling on all of creation and all of nature. While that's the most common one, it's not my personal favorite. My personal favorite is the fifth way. It's called the way of intelligent design. Thomas poses that everything in the natural world is doing a job. It has a goal. Flowers grow towards the sun, dogs bark and dig holes, etc. But most things in nature aren't intelligent. They can't choose what they're doing. It's strictly on instinct, instinct or nature. So he likens the whole world to an arrow. He said that you can shoot an arrow at a target and it can hit the target, but without somebody picking it up and pointing it and telling it where to go, that arrow is not hitting the target. That's kind of the gist of the way of intelligent design. Other than the five ways, St. Thomas did an enormous amount of writing in his lifetime. His last project would go on to be one of his most famous ones as well, and it's actually still widely used today, all the time. My mom has a copy of it in her attic, funnily enough. But that was called the Summa Theologica. The Summa Theologica, or the sum, the total of all theology, was an, I, was an attempt for St. Thomas to put everything we knew about God in one volume. 
it was actually supposed to be a reference text. It was written for seminarians, um, young men learning to be Dominican priests at the time. And the legend around this, one of the great miracles of St. Thomas's life, was that he wrote a beautiful passage on the Eucharist for the Summa Theologica, the Eucharist being part of the Catholic Mass, when a priest in the Mass raises bread and wine and it totally becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ himself. And in prayer, he offered this writing to God. He said, Jesus, take this. I did it for you. And apparently it was so beautiful that as a reward, St. Thomas was given a vision. Some people say he was given a vision of the face of God. Some people say he was given a vision of heaven itself. All we know is that his response to this vision was to take his summa, to take what he was working on, and throw it in the fire. Because he said to his secretaries, who were there at the time, and thankfully rescued the book, pulling it out of the flames, he said, compared to what I've been shown, all I have done is straw. St. Thomas Aquinas would never go on to complete his Summa Theologica. In fact, after that vision, he never wrote again. Upon his death, several of his peers took it upon themselves to complete his unfinished works, but the church did not forget about him. His importance in the development of Catholic dogma and belief can't be overstressed. Historically, the Catholic Church has called councils. They're big meetings of clergy and the Pope to determine dogma, doctrine, belief, and interpretation of scripture. And his work is so important that on the high altar where they place the Bible at these councils, they were always placed right next to St. Thomas Aquinas' work. So much of the Catholic identity and the Catholic belief system is Thomistic. And today, even if you're not a philosophy or a theology student, St. Thomas Aquinas is regularly talked about as a patron saint of all universities, of all students, of all people looking to learn. And I think he makes a great patron for this channel, too. If you're curious about learning more about St. Thomas's work, there are a couple of things I can recommend to you. Like I mentioned before, everything will be linked in the description of this video, but just offhand, I can't recommend enough thomasaquinasonline.com. Uh, the website's a little bit dated, but if you can get around that, the content is fantastic. A good book to start with is the Handbook for Peeping Thomists, which is on Amazon for I think about 20 bucks. And if you're maybe past your first level of understanding St. Thomas, the podcast Pines with Aquinas is really great too. It's a little dry, it's a little theological, so you can't say I didn't warn you, but I highly recommend it. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really hope that you come back and watch some more videos in the future. If you're curious about some other projects I have going on, maybe you want some more Catholic content on your normal Twitter and Instagram feeds, feel free to follow me at NoSinGang on Twitter and Instagram. And as always, don't forget to get holy because you will die trying. Have a great day. Hey, my name's Tommy the Aquino. Tommy.